Say to God, come on, put those hands together. Let's praise him today. Let's praise him. Yes, it's just something about Sunday morning. Well, said I can't on, wait. All oh, to Sunday morning. Sunday morning. To sing and shout. Sing and shout. And praise the Lord. Well, So good to be together again. Thank you so much for joining us. We are truly going to worship God this morning. The Holgate Street Church of Christ just wants to say welcome to everyone. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalms, the 18th chapter, beginning in the 30th verse, and it reads, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. It is flawless. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he sets me on high places. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. Let us pray. Father, it is so good to be back in your presence. It is so good to have another opportunity to acknowledge who you are and what you have done. You truly are our rock. You truly are our salvation. We ask that you would bless us as we worship you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, that the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Unto the Lord, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, unto the Lord, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, unto the Lord, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise his name from the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, once again, we thank you for this opportunity to meet with you 
on this beautiful day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to be in your presence, to be in your place, to be in your space. Dear God, with, without hesitation, we are reminded every day of just how wonderful you are, how powerful you are, how loving, kind, and merciful you are. Dear God, we just thank you so much because we know that when we worship you, we are worshiping the one and only true God. And we're humbled by that amazing fact. Dear God, when we think about how great you are and how amazing you are, how awesome you are, we are quickly reminded of how sinful we are. We are quickly reminded of how insignificant we are. We are quickly reminded of how small we are. And then our sin is ever before us. When we get up in the morning, our sin is there. As we go through the day, our sin is there. When we lay our heads down at night to rest, our sin is there. But dear God, we are not in despair over that because we are covered by your grace. And in spite of all the sin that we may have in our lives, your sin, your, your grace is greater than any of our sins. Father, we're just thankful that we can come to you and we can confess our sins to you. We can be covered by your grace and made to be better. Father, we just thank you for sending your son to die for us. And many times, Father, in our daily lives, we lose sight of the fact of how wonderful that gift really is. Thank you for allowing him to come. Thank you for the lessons that he taught while he was here, the miracles that he performed while he was here, the good that he demonstrated while he was here. We just thank you for the gift of your son. Heavenly Father, as we continue to deal with these uncertain and difficult times related to uh, the coronavirus. Father, we hear about it every day. We hear about the death totals. We hear about the cases. We hear sometimes we're almost overwhelmed with the amount of information that we receive. And many times, Father, with that information coming at us rapid speed, many times we lose sight of the fact that you're still in control. Regardless of what's happening, Father, you are still in charge. We continue to lean on you and trust on you to be with us uh, in these difficult times and these difficult days. Be with us as we move forward. Help us to realize at the end of the day, Father, all we have is you. All we have is one another. Father, thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for this time of praise with you today. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we humbly pray. Amen.
This is the part of our service where we gather around the Lord's table and remember the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I would like to read a few verses from Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, beginning in the 13th verse this morning. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who appalled, were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouth because of him. For what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. I would like to invite you this morning to the foot of the cross. I would then invite you to look up and to see our suffering Savior. Can you see the crown of thorns? Can you see his beaten body? Can you see the spikes that hold him there? He did all of that for us. He did all of that to save us. Let's remember him. Will you pray with me? Father, we want to thank you for the gift of your son. We want to thank you for his willingness to come here and die on the cross for us. Father, we want to remember what he went through this morning. As we partake of this bread, help us to see his body that hung on the cross. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to see the blood that was shed for us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Did you see what God does? He increases. He enlarges. He enriches. He's an amazing giver. And he wants us to be just like him. Let's pray. Father, you truly blessed us. You truly enriched our lives. You bless us continually. Father, this is our opportunity to give back to you. And we want to be the kind of giver that you have been, that you have shown us. Father, we ask that you would help us with our faith, that we can hope and trust in you, and that, to know that you will take care of everything else. Father, we ask that you would bless our offering this morning. Father, we want to grow your kingdom, and we ask that you would help us as we do that. Help us with our decision-making. Help us with our offering. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. There are three ways which you can give this morning. The first way is to go to the website, holgatecfc.com, hit the donate tab, the PayPal menu will drop down and you can enter your information there. The second way is by mail. You can mail your check to Holgate Street Church of Christ, box 18226, Seattle, Washington, 98118. The third way is through the Zelle app. You can send your payment directly to treasurer at holgatecfc.com. Thank you. Heavenly armor will enter the land, the battle belongs.
belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a stand in the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in harm, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, Welcome everyone, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us this morning for this online presentation. I'm excited to be back with you this morning to share this message that I trust will be an encouragement to you, as it I hope it will be to me as we look into the Word of God. So I'm going to go quickly this morning to Matthew chapter 11. I invite you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to be reading the first six verses of Matthew chapter 11. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. It might read a little bit differently than your version, but it is the Word of God all the same. Matthew chapter 11, and starting with verse 1. So when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And again, that's Matthew 11 in the first six verses. Well, we continue to move through uh, one of the most challenging times that we have all ever experienced. By far the most challenging health crisis um, this country has experienced in a century. And uh, at the recording of this online presentation, there are nearly 95,000 Americans who have succumbed to this virus in a period of about three months. And I was able to share with you guys maybe a month ago, and, and it was bad at that time, but uh, I don't know if we would have thought that 100,000 Americans would have been dead in just a month's time, but here we are. Many states are reopening, uh, and some of you that are watching this presentation this morning might be in states that are reopening or partially reopening, and as many states are reopening, Many of us are still alarmed and a bit worried that perhaps these, this reopening might be a little bit premature. And then to top it all off, there's like this segment of the population that has really politicized this event. Some people are even questioning whether 90,000 people have even died from this virus. Some people are refusing to even wear masks in public. I guess what I'm trying to share with you this morning as I begin is that it's really bad out there. 
And, you know, I try to stay positive and I, I want to give you a message of hope. And I intend to give you a message of hope today from the word of God. But I also want to recognize that, that we are in uncharted waters. And it's really bad out there. And for a lot of us, it's even really bad inside. As we look at this text this morning, I want us to also relate to this text that we have read for us to understand that John is also experiencing a really bad moment in his life. It's a really bad moment for John because John was imprisoned for speaking truth to power. Now, some of us have been in prison. Some of us have been in jail. Some of us have done things that, that maybe we shouldn't have done and maybe we deserved to be where we were. It's one thing to be in prison, but it's an entirely different thing to be in prison unjustly. It's an entirely different thing to be in prison and to be in prison because you chose to do something that, that was right, that was honorable, and that was uplifting the word of God. And that's what John was doing. And that's why he was in prison. And human nature is of such is that when you suffer unjustly, you look to really have that corrected and corrected quickly. <laughs> so can you imagine putting yourself in the position of John, putting yourself in John's shoes, John the Baptist sitting in jail unjustly? Now, John doesn't fit your average mold of a Jewish teacher. John confused a lot of the Jewish leaders when he came on the scene. As a matter of fact, you read in John chapter 1 and verse 19 that, that some of the leaders had actually sent out some of their spies to go, y'all, y'all go find out about John. See what he's all about because we don't really understand what he's doing. John 1 19, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, that is John, who are you? And he confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, verse 21, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need you to answer us so we can tell those who sent us to find out who you are. What do you say about yourself? Why the intrigue and why the one wonder about John? Because John didn't fit the traditional mold and model of Jewish teachers of that time. Jesus even solidifies this thought in the very chapter that we read at the beginning. Matthew chapter 11 started with verse 7, which is the very next verse. After we ended the reading, look at what Jesus says. Jesus began to speak to the crowd and he said, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Basically, Jesus is saying, you know, John, is, John doesn't just blow with the wind. He doesn't go over here if you want him to go over here. And then he says this if you want him to say this. That's not what John does. John doesn't just throw it up and just see which way the wind is blowing. And that's what I'll say to appease the people. No. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Jesus says, behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. They are comfortable. They are relaxed. They have their needs taken care of. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, Jesus says. And I tell you, he was much more than a prophet. So John was outside of the typical traditional mold of Jewish teachers. The text says he lived in the wilderness, preached in the wilderness. He wore camel's hair as his garment. And of course, he ate locusts and wild honey. John was considered strange, but John had a mission. And John was faithful to that mission. And John accepted what I call a hard ministry. A ministry that, that is difficult. And I know those of us, even those of us that are, that are faith leaders, sometimes we have faith experiences in certain communities that is very easy to lead and very easy to minister. And then we have other communities that, that are more challenging. And John had a challenging ministry. John had a very difficult task. And what does John get in return for accepting the difficult task? He's in jail unjustly. 
How was John repaid for his sacrifices? He's sitting in a jail cell by himself, not knowing what's going to happen. Why? All because somebody didn't like something he said. John got into it with Herod, saying that the arrangement that he had with Herodias was not lawful. Herodias had previously or had been married to Philip, Herod's brother, and John inserted himself into that situation and told truth to power, and now he's sitting in jail because he said something, not because he did something, but because he said something that somebody didn't like. And I can imagine John sitting in prison by himself thinking, is this it? Like, is, is this what my life has come to? Is this, is this the culmination of my sacrifice and my dedication to the hard ministry that was given to me? Is this how it's going to end? Is this all? You know, because uh, I, I kind of thought it would be different. And how many of us, may I ask us a question? May I ask us all a question this morning? How many of us, how many of us have been blindsided in life by the I kind of thoughts? <laughs> I kind of thought it would be this, and I kind of thought it would be that. And then you get to a point in life where you're down and out, and you say, is this it? Because I kind of thought it would be different. I kind of thought it would be easier. I kind of thought that I would have more success. And boy, aren't we mulling through a lot of I kind of thoughts right now during this pandemic? Class of 2020, you've been working hard for 12 years. And you kind of thought you'd have an awesome last semester. And you kind of thought you'd have a prom. And you kind of thought you'd have a nice graduation. And you kind of thought you would have great times with your friends that you would remember forever. And all you got was uh, you know, sitting at home every day in front of a computer and you'll get your diploma in the mail. And some of you might have some type of online celebration. I kind of thought it would be better. It would be different. Some of us have lost our jobs. Some of us are going to lose our jobs sometime in this calendar year. And some of these jobs are jobs that we worked hard to get. We sacrificed a lot to get these jobs. Some of us uprooted ourselves from one place to another to get a job that we have, all to find out that because of this unseen enemy, this virus, we're going to lose our job. Some have already lost their jobs. But we kind of thought we'd be at this job for a long time. I know the first time that I got into ministry, my, one of my first ministry positions and uh, in my very early 20s, and you know, you, you are naive, and so you kind of think, you know, I, I, I think I'll be at this church in about 15, 20 years. And it comes to an end, and then you go to your next ministry position, and you say, oh, oh, this is the one. I'm going to be here a long time. And then it took me to about that third or fourth one to understand that things don't always end how you think they're going to end. You can kind of think, but the reality sometimes can be much different. Even as sometimes we have sworn to ourselves, oh, certain things will come about or will not come about in our lives, and it ends up being the, the exact opposite. I'm reminded, I'm actually reminded of a story uh, one time when I was a very young boy, and uh, I was around my grandfather, and um, I remember him saying something that always stuck with me, because when he said it, I, I disagreed with him in my head. You know, you know, from the old school, you really couldn't disagree with your grandparents out in the open, but you just kind of kept it to yourself. And so, uh, you know, my grandfather, he used to always talk like that, and he said, you know, he's, he said, boy, there's going to be a very few people in life who at some point in their lives are not going to be counting pennies. And I said to myself, into myself, in my head, oh, no, Papa, I don't, I'm not going to be counting pennies because I'm going to go up, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to get this education, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to make sure that I'm not counting pennies at least no time in my life. But um, I will have you know that uh, it has gotten bad for me at certain times in my adult life. Like so bad, you know, you ever go through your old church clothes and see if you found any spare change, any loose dollars in your old church clothes. I only share that with you so you can understand that it always doesn't turn out like you think it's going to turn out. 
because you kind of thought you were going to do this and kind of thought you were going to do that and kind of end up here and it just doesn't happen like that. And I hope at a certain level you can identify with some of these kind of thoughts. Now, it's not always a bad thing. Sometimes, you know, life turns out much better than we planned. And we ought to celebrate that. We ought to recognize that. But, but here's the thing about human nature is that we typically don't focus on those things or those areas where it turned out better. We should, and we should focus on them more and be more thankful for them. But where we typically spend our time mentally is, I thought life would be this. I thought this experience would be this, and it turned out to be something quite different. So it looks like in this text in Matthew 11, John kind of thought he would not end up in prison unjustly. Meanwhile, he hears all of these wonderful things that Jesus is doing. Jesus is healing the sick. The lame are walking. The blind can see. But here I am in jail. And I kind of thought I wouldn't end up in jail. And so John now, John needs some clarity. <laughs> you ever notice sometimes in life, like, things is just not making sense to you, and you're just going to have to reach out and ask, them, ask someone and get some clarity? So John needs to get some clarity. John sends some of his disciples to talk to Jesus. And in verse 3, John asks this question. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we Look for another? Oh, that's a very sly question. That's a very sly question right there, John. Are you the one? John has a very sneaky way here of asking really another question. The question he asks is, are you the one? But that's not the real question. There is another question. There is a real question that is behind, that is under, and that is actually supporting the question that is asked. And many times we do, we do this in life. We do this as human beings. We ask one question, but the real question that we want to ask is hidden behind the question that we ask. John asks, are you the one? But are you the one really means, am I getting out of jail? Are you the one to get me out of jail or do I need to be looking to somebody else to get me out of this predicament? Because I kind of thought I was not going to end up in jail, at least, at least not this long, alone, and I don't know what's going to be the end of this situation. That's the real question here. Am I getting out of here? Now, John here in a sense is leaning toward doing what we all do as human beings. And that is we inextricably connect God's nature and his faithfulness and even sometimes his existence. We connect that to whether or not he does what we want him to do. And if he does it, on the timeline that we want him to do it. So if God doesn't do what we want him to do, he doesn't do it like we want him to do it, and he doesn't do it on the timeline that we want him to do it, then we go in on his nature. We go in on his faithfulness, and some of us even go in on his existence. And John is creeping towards this area when he asks this question, are you the one? But the real question is, am I getting out of here? Are you the one to get me out of here? May I remind you, John was actually preaching that he was the one. John came sharing the message that there was one greater than him coming behind him who was the one. Notice John chapter 1 and verse number 26. John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even one who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing the next day. 
he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. John continues to talk about the Christ. I myself did not know him, verse 33, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John spent his ministry proclaiming the very thing he's now questioning in jail. He is the one, has now become, are you the one? He is the one preaching out in the wilderness. Are you the one alone in his jail cell? And why? Such a change in what John is saying because John is coming to terms with the reality that it's not turned out like he thought. Now, I don't have time to develop this, but we see this all through the Gospels that what the disciples of Jesus understand to be the reign and the rule of God is not what they think it is. All through the Gospels, and even after Jesus' resurrection in Acts chapter 1, you find his disciples still having some misconceptions about the kingdom, about what it means to be under the rule and the reign of God in this world. And we see this right here. Brothers and sisters, I want us to understand and to know and to feel it is okay. It's okay when life makes us question God. And that's okay because you and I are human. And you and I have expectations about how we think life is going to turn out. And when life doesn't turn out like that, I want you to know that it's okay to have questions. It was okay for John to reach out in this moment of yes, weakness, this moment of, yes, fear. To say, God, I need clarity. God, I need you to help me understand this because it's not turning out like I thought. Now, most of us at some point in our lives will question the very core things that we have at some time in the past affirmed. Now, maybe your life is rosy and great and nothing bad has ever happened to you. And I don't say that disparagingly, but I know that a whole lot of us, life has been rough. Life has been tough. And the longer you live, the longer you'll understand that you're going to go through some ups in this life, but you are going to go through some downs. And life will knock you down on your knees and have you question the very thing that you once affirmed. But as, as interesting as John's question is, is Jesus' statement. Read with me now verse 4 of Matthew 11. Jesus tells John's disciples that came to him with that question, are you the one or do we need to look for another? Jesus says, go tell John. The blind have sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached to them. And then he says something that's very sobering. And really, I think, one of the main thoughts I hope you take from this presentation today. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus tells John, yes, John, there are a lot of good things that are happening. But look here, John, don't get discouraged by what you don't see happening. There are a lot of things that I'm doing. But don't get, don't get discouraged by what I'm not doing. The lame are walking, the deaf are hearing, and the blind are seeing. But I don't need you to stumble and fall if you don't see 
those same manifestations in your situation. Very interesting. Look at this word, offended. Very interesting word here. Uh, blessed is the one who is not offended in me. And offended there is kind of a, it, it's kind of a difficult word for us to understand in this particular verse because we, we have a modern understanding and connotation we ascribe to offended that is really not always um, the most accurate as we interpret that word, how it appears in the Bible. This word, as many of you know, the Bible is not written in English. So in the language in which the Bible was written, this part of the Bible was written in Greek. This word in Greek, offended, is translated scandalizo, scandalizo. Sounds like scandal, scandalizo. Our word scandal is related to this word scandalizo, which is translated offended. Why do I tell you that? It help you understand what Jesus is really saying here. One of the definitions of the word scandal is like an offense that is a fault or an offense that is caused by some type of misdeed. Okay? So here is how this word, if I took this word scandalizo, which is translated offended, if I looked at how this word is used all through the New Testament, there are a number of ways it's used. It's talked about as putting a stumbling block. It's talked about as putting an impediment in someone's way that they might trip or fall. It can, be, it can mean enticement to sin. It can cause a person to begin to distrust. Notice now, distrust or desert one whom they should trust or obey. To cause, to fall away. To see in another what I disapprove or what hinders me from acknowledging someone's authority. This is what this word means, to be offended. Scandalizo. To fall or to stumble. So what is Jesus saying here? He uses the same word in Matthew 13. Do you guys remember the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13? Do you remember the, the, the seed that fell uh, on rocky ground? Here's what Jesus said about the seed that fell on the rocky ground. It's the one who hears the word, immediately receives the word with joy, but what? It does not take root. It endures for a while, and when tribulation and persecution arise on account of the word, immediately he falls away. See that falls away right there? That's Matthew 13, verses 20 and 21. When it says he falls away, you know what word that is? It's the same word where Jesus says, offended in me. And in Matthew 13, in the parable of the sower, he connects this falling away to someone who stumbles when persecution and when, and when tribulation come as a result of the word. In other words, when things get difficult when you're going through a pandemic, when you're sitting alone in your jail cell unjustly, this is when you are tempted to scandalizo, to stumble, to fall away. But Jesus tells John, blessed is the man who does not stumble because of me. In other words, because of what I'm doing, because I'm what I'm not doing, blessed is the one who doesn't stumble. Jesus is basically telling John, don't give in to the temptation to fall away, give up, lose faith. Because the good that you are hearing about happening in other places does not come to you. I need to repeat that. I need to repeat that because that, that's my interpretation of what, of what Jesus is telling John. Don't give in to the temptation to fall away. The temptation to give up, the temptation to lose faith. Don't give in to that temptation because the good that you're seeing happening in other places, that good doesn't come to you. Now, why would Jesus need to tell John something like this if, in fact, everything was going to be okay? How many times do we tell people that? And I really need to encourage us, especially those who are listening, who are, who are leaders in faith communities, that sometimes we, 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 we glibly just tell people when they are in a difficult situation or when they're asking, where is God? Or how could God allow? Or, or is my life going to get better? Is my situation going to improve? Everything's going to be okay. I'm not sure that's the best thing that we need to tell people. I certainly don't hear that in what Jesus responds to John, in how Jesus responds to John. Because many people interpret that phrase, everything is going to be okay. Many people interpret that phrase to mean that God is going to grant them what they have requested of him just as they have requested. When we tell someone everything is going to be okay, many people interpret that to mean that they're going to get what they asked for, that it's going to be just as they want it. 
I don't see those reassurances always in Scripture. And I surely don't see it in Matthew 11 where Jesus tells John, yeah, there's good going on out here, but I need you to remain faithful if you don't see that good come to you in your situation. Jesus needed to give John an answer that would help John in that jail cell because things were about to get worse for John, not better. And most of you know how this story ends. It does not end well for John from a human perspective. Jesus needed to give John a word that would give him assurance when he saw the executioner coming down the way with the sword in his hand. John died in prison. John was killed in prison. John was murdered. John was beheaded. And Jesus, in his divine state, knew that that was what was awaiting John and implored him, don't lose faith. Don't stumble because of my ministry and because the salvation and the release that I'm bringing to the world may not improve your situation. I'm doing a great work. And John, your life and your ministry has been a part of this great work. But this is how it's going to end. So I ask us this morning as I get ready to close, what are the real questions that you and I are asking? What are the questions behind the question? I think we want to know, will things be normal again? Will I keep my job? Will I have to sell, name it, my car, my house? Will I have to move? Will the church survive? I don't mean the church universally. I mean that there are congregations that are struggling right now. I mean that there are local churches right now who don't see a way out past COVID because they are suffering financially, they are suffering to have a presence online, and they don't even know when we will be released to go back to, quote, normal, because we don't even know if there will be a normal like there was before. I know there are a lot of faith leaders that are asking that question about the churches that they lead. Will my church survive? Will I get the virus? Will I get sick? Will I die from coronavirus? These are the real questions. And we, we, you know, we, we talk and we have these ways of, oh, it's bad out there. I don't know. And we sound a whole lot like John where we have questions that we ask and statements that we say and musings and hooing and hawing. But we, we, we have some really, really hard questions that I think we need to be honest about asking. And I want to release us today to say it's okay to ask these questions. It's okay to reach out from my jail cell to say, Lord, give me some clarity. Because COVID has messed up our I kind of thoughts. Whether we are graduates to this year, whether we are employed and potentially will be unemployed, whether we are financially well and are now potentially having to sit in line at a food bank or apply for unemployment, and we thought that we would always be above that in our life, COVID has messed with our I kind of thought. And I want you and I want me to be honest about the real questions that we have inside. And don't mind those folks who say we shouldn't ask questions like this because I believe that they are misguided. Jesus did not get upset with John because he asked that question. Jesus did not chide as John said, John, you ought, to, you ought to have more faith than to ask something like that. Here you were out here proclaiming I was the one, and now you're in your jail cell wondering, John, I would have expected more of you. 
Jesus didn't get upset with John. He reassured John and gave him something that he needed to help him understand the end of that situation. And, and I find it a bit unfair that we are always juxtapositioning faith and fear. You either got faith or you're scared. You, you can't be faithful dealing with your fears or you can't be a person who is scared but yet there are sprouts of faith in your life. It always has to be one or the other. Yet when I look in the Bible, I always see great men and women of faith who were afraid. They just had to push through their fears. We see here in this text, John the Baptist was afraid. The apostle Peter was afraid, denied him three times. The rest of the disciples were afraid. They could not be found when the authorities came to arrest Jesus and even Jesus himself in the garden of Gethsemane, sweat as it was, drops of blood. There, even in his human element, there was some worry there. There was some uncertainty. There was some stress. And I want us to understand that that's okay. That it is okay to experience fear. Yes, we need to push past them. And we've had a ton of lessons in the previous weeks that have talked about pushing past our fears. But sometimes we, we, we run past the idea of having fears, and so many of us, I think, are still stuck in that stage where we are really scared. It's okay to experience fear. And experiencing fear does not diminish all of the times in the past that we have magnified God's greatness and we have expressed faith in the past, if at a certain time now in the present or in the future I express fear, it does not undo what I've said and done in the past, as it did not for John. This moment in John's life does not undo his ministry. It, in fact, magnifies his ministry for me because it shows me that John, even in his greatness, was a human being, that John struggled just like we all struggle, and he needed reassurance. So is everything going to be all right? Well, yes, everything is going to be all right if we understand what that means. If we understand that that is referencing the final resurrection, if we understand that that is referencing the transformation of our bodies, if we understand that everything is going to be all right is referencing the consummation of all things, the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness, everything is going to be all right. But as you and I remain here on this earth, let us understand, blessed are the ones who don't stumble at what we judge to be God's action or, or inaction in this world. Blessed are the ones who endure until the end, because the one who endures until the end, Jesus said, shall be saved. I don't know what the end of this pandemic will be. I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know who will survive and who will not survive. I don't know what will survive and what will not survive. Because, you know, it's not for me to even know those things. It's not for me to know the ins and the outs of the workings of God. And I don't even know what God is doing with this pandemic. So many, I hear so many people talking like with so much assurance that they know what God is doing in this pandemic. I don't know what God is doing. There's a whole lot that I can know. There's a whole lot that I can rely on. And what I know is, is that I am choosing not to stumble at what God is doing or what God is not doing in the world. I know that I choose not to get offended at what I judge to be God's action or God's inaction. And what I know is that neither life nor death, and nor angels nor rulers, nor things past, things present, nor things to come. No power, no height and no depth, no jail cell and no virus, and not anything in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And to that, I know the whole church can say, amen. Pray with me. 
Lord, thank you for reminding us this morning through this text that it is okay to wonder about your workings in this world in times of difficulty. Thank you for the ministry of John. Thank you for his faith and for, in this text, we see his humanity and for his example of enduring until the end. May we take it and may it springboard us into this present time as we continue to manage through COVID-19. Give us a faith that is similar and that will keep us in the hollow of your holy and powerful hand until the very end. And we'll be careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us for our worship service this morning. I want to invite you to join us together with your brothers and sisters at 11 o'clock. And we'll be lasting for about uh, 30 minutes. We'll have a period of prayer and encouragement. Just on our website, holgatecoc.com. Just click on the link and you can join us by video. If you don't have your computer there, uh, you can also call in by telephone. That's holgatecoc.com. Click on the link and join us for a live interaction. The morning. Well, said I can't on, wait. I can't oh, wait to Sunday morning. To Sunday morning. To sing and shout. To sing and shout. And praise the Lord. Praise well, the Lord. Lord. Well, I Sunday morning, Sunday morning, gather together, gather together, church together. in one accord. Hey, said it's something about. about Sunday morning, said it makes me happy, happy deep inside. Deep well, I take God my first and every one of my days. I give it to the Lord and I leave him there.